Hello, everybody. It's Natalie from Creative Makers. I am so happy to see you. Thank you for being here. Um, this next person, as most of my people, I met by accident. <laughs> On purposely accident. I was at a USC Hospital Medical School Keck Center, and there was a talk there being given called Art and Med, where it melds artists and medicine together. I'll let, I'll let my guest speak about this more. But because of that, I met last week's interview, and here is the person that does this program, or does the art portion of this program, mm -hmm. am I correctly? This is Ted Mayer, everybody, or Meyer, sorry. Meyer. I like to say Mayer. It can be either. Why. I'll answer to anything. Anyway, thank you for being here with us. Sure, thank you. All right, so hello to people that are on. Hi, Georgia. Um, okay, so I'm going to just start right in. This okay. is the only question I ask, and then everything sort of plays off of this, however it goes down. Okay, I'm ready. I'm ready. He was, he's been asking me about what I was going to talk to him about. The What I want to know about is how did your creativity show up for you when you were a kid? I just always drew. My dad, my dad was a really good artist although he didn't do anything with it. He went into business, which was a shame. But I would always draw. I would draw around the house, and I was sick a lot. I would always bring art supplies with me to the hospital. So I was just always drawing. Did you, I mean, in school, were you that kid, the artist kid? Uh, I, were, I was the artist kid, but I also missed a lot of school. I was sick a lot. Oh. So I was mostly home drawing. But... When I was in school, I was that that kid. I was always little, so I couldn't have been the sports kid, and I couldn't have been. <laughs> I wasn't a brainiac, so I wasn't the smart kid. So I was, I was the drawing kid. You were the art kid. And did you know right from there and then that that's that was it? That's what you wanted to do? No, I. I you know what? I didn't. I was really sick as a kid, so my main priority as a kid was just surviving through it. And then when it got closer to going to college, I decided mostly with, originally I had wanted to go to like FIT and do fashion or, um, but my parents were very adamant about a four year school. So I went to Arizona State for graphic design because I thought at least I can do something creative and, you know, it's art and I can make a living. So that's what I did. And I did that for, God, for 30 years. You were a graphic artist for 30 years? Yeah. Oh, my God. And that was... That was this is where you go, you don't look that old. You don't yeah. look that old. <laughs> yeah. But, I mean, this was before computers sort of took over this medium. Yeah, so I, I did it for... I did graphics for a couple of years, and I hated it. I just... I didn't like the pre-computer graphics. Um I mean, I like doing logos and things, but I got stuck doing all the other crap and I didn't like it. And then I had a t-shirt greeting card company for about eight years and that did really well. And um, then during the Reagan recession, um, a lot of the little small gift shops went out of business. Mm. So I had been in hundreds of stores at one point and then um, a lot of them closed. So I closed the business and moved to New York for about two years with my partner at the time. And New York kicked my ass and I came back to California. And by then computers were a thing. So I got back to doing graphics for a while. I just ran into somebody who offered me a job and I took it and I did that for a while. And I, I landed up doing a lot of magazine illustrations, a lot of, um, photography for my clients. I just really broadened what I did. The more uh, technology came in and you could do photography without having to worry about developing film and you could actually see, you know, it was pretty easy to be a photographer if you could see what you were doing and you could make the adjustments then. So you didn't need the, the skill set. So I did that for a while and then I got sick of that and started the art and medicine thing. Okay. So let me go back for just a second. Do you mind me asking? You say were saying that you were sick as a child. Do you mind me asking about? Yeah, that? I had a genetic illness called Gaucher's disease. It's a it's an enzyme deficiency that caused 
a lot of bone pain and organ complications and things. And then when I was about 42, they came up with a treatment for it. So now I'm basically normal. Oh, wow. So, I mean, it took all that time, though. I mean, they didn't have a treatment for it until you were 42? No. Wow. And you're finding it super effective? It is. And luckily, I lived long enough to get the, the treatment. Is that not usually the case with that? It, it was not before. Well, I'm so happy. Me too. <laughs> My brother landed up having much worse symptoms, developed Parkinson's and died oh, so from it. So, too. Yeah. Oh, I'm so sorry. Okay, I want to get to the art and med, but before I get to that, I mean, all this time that you're drawing and all the rest of it, you learned how to paint as well, right? I just taught myself to paint. Yes. I, when I was in school, I took a lot of silk screening. I liked like very clean Swiss design. So I did, I did silk screening. I did illustration, very flat colors. Um, and then when I graduated college there was one year where um a, a christmas and a girlfriend said well you keep saying you're an artist paint something and she gave me an easel and a bunch of paints and i started painting and that was probably that was five good. or six years after school and then i just started painting and things started selling so that's it that's but i wrote but i <laughs> but i i do like i really like painting so was is there a particular artist that inspired you know inspired a lot of the pre-war germans i like max beckman i like chagall um, otto dix all those people i like things with a narrative to them i'm not not a huge abstract fan but you do abstract you know i did one series oh moon huts let's see can you see us now georgia no signal I want to make sure that anything oh, did you sign on to the no i didn't sign on it looks i think we're okay i'm not sure okay so we're okay good. thank you thanks georgia okay <laughs> Sorry, it's like everybody. Your, it's like George's personal TV channel. It's a, <laughs> it is. We're talking to George <laughs> mostly. And I saw somebody else doing but I can't, I can't keep track. I'm sorry. Those of you that, that lost us for a second there, I'm sorry. This happens on occasion. Okay, so I'm sorry. We were we were talking you were talking about people calling you at eleven o'clock at night and oh, yeah, being yeah. appreciative. Yeah, well, not not a matter of not being appreciative, just being frantic and I didn't like being frantic anymore. You know, there's a certain point when you've been sick a lot of your life, you just sort of like, this is not my issue to yeah. deal with. I'm just happy to be here and I want to enjoy being here. So there, there was just a point I just decided I was done with it. And also it, you used to be able to make a really good living doing illustrations and things, but now everything is online. You can buy an illustration for 20 bucks. So instead of making a thousand for drawing, a magazine can go, instead of paying you a thousand, they'll go online and find something that sort of matches the subject for 15 yeah. bucks. And it's really hard to compete against that. Yeah. Yeah. Because <clears throat> skill level doesn't matter anymore. You know, it's not even skill level. It's that there's so much out there that you can license. So many websites licensing illustrations for 50 to 500 dollars that doesn't pay for a small publication to you know hire you to do something for a thousand right right okay so let's move to art and med okay. now i sort of now because i know of your background and and being in hospitals a lot as a child i can sort of see the a little bit closer of an angle to what your program the, mm -hmm. that you're doing. So let's talk about that. Okay. Well, so when I was a kid and I was in the hospital all the time, um, I was in a lot of teaching hospitals in New York and, and the doctors would come in and they would tap my stomach because I had an enlarged spleen and they would talk about this rare illness I had. And, but they would never talk to me. I was just, they were this, just talking about you talking about me and then they'd leave. And, that it really bothered me then it bothers me now even to think about it 
And I just kept thinking as an adult, you know, what can I, once I had my health, I kept thinking, well, what can I do to maybe go back into that world and make a change in it? And I thought, well, I like art. I like art about people's illnesses. I'm very comfortable talking to people who have illnesses because I had one. Mm -hmm. So I approached UCLA about starting a program there. And at the time they said, well, we have no money, but if you want to try this, we can, we'll give you the wall space to do it. So I did that for a couple years uh, with some success. We had a couple really nice shows, but it wasn't really the program I wanted. And then USC, I got a call from someone at USC and they brought me in, gave me a salary. They said, we have an actual gallery space that's being underutilized. So once I got to USC, we tied the program of bringing patients who do work about their illnesses in to the school. And we find, or I find artists whose work corresponds to the body systems that the med students are studying in the core curriculum. So it's all tied together. Everything's tied together. So that if the med students are in neurological, I'll find an artist like Tim with Parkinson's, or I'll find somebody with MS. And if they're studying respiratory, I'll find somebody with cystic fibrosis or, you know, another, another pulmonary illness or something. But we tie it to the core curriculum, we give them a show, and then we have uh, a lecture where I interview them about how art is their muse in a way, um, how it helps them make art. And then we also have a doctor on stage who's an expert in that field. And we have them talk about whether they can see the lived experience of the patient through the art that the artist is showing. So the artists have to be doing work about their illness. I don't want someone who's had a heart transplant doing you know, landscapes. Mm-hmm. I want them to do work that speaks directly to their experience as a patient. Mm. I have a question though, but what if they told you that their landscapes were tied to that? Yeah, I probably wouldn't. You still wouldn't? Not unless they weren't doing something different before. <clears throat> ah, okay. You know, if they, they came and said, well, n- now that I'm healthy and I can walk again and I have more mobility, I like being out and I'm doing, that's one thing, but that's usually not the way it works. Right, right. So how do you find your artists for the program? They sort of I find mean, me. It's, sort of, it's so specific. They find me. There aren't a lot of places that show work by patient artists. So I get emails all the time. This is my illness. This is my work. Look at my, my website. So years ago, when I started feeling better, we, we sort of missed one section of all this. When I started feeling better and I stopped doing work about my own illness, mm-hmm. I started doing work about other people's illnesses with this Scarred for Life series. Mm-hmm. And I would do prints of people who had severe life altering complications that left them scarred. And then I started getting emails from people all over the world, you know, Africa, Australia. My my arm got cut off in the Civil War in Africa. I got bitten by a shark in Australia. I mean, all these crazy people would send me pictures of their scars. And then as I started, so I already had sort of a following. Mm-hmm. And then as I switched to doing the art and med thing, I started getting emails from people all over the place. You know, this is the work I'm doing about my heart transplant or my liver transplant or, you know, my Parkinson's or scoliosis, whatever, spina bifida, whatever the yeah. illness. Um, and I just keep them. I have a, you have you know, just a running list. A running list. And then every year I try to match everybody up to the shows. This is, it sounds like it. It, it could be very emotional work for you. Is it? N- not really I mean, it would for be me. for me. I, I should, I should 
take the ownership of that. It would be very challenging and emotional work for me, I think. And I love this sort of topic, mm -hmm. you know, but I can see that I would become very invested. No, because it's the world I've been in since I was a little kid. Right. You know? So you have a certain amount of understanding and distance yeah. at the same time. I mean, when you see someone who's, who's suffering, yeah, of course you feel a compassion for them, but I'm looking at it as, as an artist and where does their art come from and what does their art speak to? And, and so I'm, I'm really looking at it as a curator. Mm -hmm. Do you find that other people's work and, and their circumstances have influenced you a lot? No, I, because I, I'm sort of isolated in how I do my work, you know, but, you know, like lately I've been doing all these floaty people and everyone's like, oh, they look sort of Shigali, which they probably do. And that's funny. I did. I, I think I <laughs> you know, said that to somebody. But, I, but I've done that kind since I was a little kid, these little floaty figures. So I, I try not to be too affected by other people's work. But I love, I love what everybody has to say. I'm constantly amazed by how people interpret their, their artwork, how, how they interpret their illnesses. It's just. I find the imagery, imagery really strong. I find it more powerful than, I'd rather look at a badly painted work about illness and its effect on someone's psyche than I would, you know, a really beautiful floral or something like right. that. Something that doesn't have anything connected to it that, you, that you're invested in. Yeah. Is there somebody's work that stands out to you that was especially moving? They all are. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of amazing. And, and I see people doing work about illnesses that I'm just so glad I don't have, you know, yeah. that, you know, when you're when you're sick, but then you see, you know, it always seems the things you they probably wouldn't want what I had and I don't want what they have. Yeah. You know, yeah. Do you, is there a common denominator that you see either in the people that are affected by their illness or in their work? A common thread. I th I just always think their work is better. I really think the work, especially if they've come on their illness midlife or something, I think the work is much better after they've been sick. I just think it's more powerful. We're getting beeps here. If you hear beeping, there's a truck backing up. Um, and I I want to just say a little disclaimer here. Um, please don't get sick just so you can do better work. <laughs> <clears throat> um, I don't want this. Okay. Hi, George is asking, is it only about physical illnesses? Oh, I guess maybe you're asking about mental illnesses as yeah. well. Yeah. Um, yeah, at the moment, because that's what the med school is doing. So we do the bio, we do the body systems, respiratory, pulmonary, neurological. Um, they don't have a section on at least first and second year on mental illness. So we don't do those. But the work always includes, like I'm going to grab one off my wall. Yeah. Okay, so this is a work by uh, a guy who landed up having a uh, lung transplant. And I mean, if you look at the, he did this right before he had his lung transplant and he's contemplating the idea of, having some part of someone else's body in his body. So it is not the best painted piece in the world, but it is one of my favorite pieces. I think it's so strong. It is. You know, so. And I, what it, did he do this on? It's almost like he did the, he does, this he on was, Gossamer. He, he does his paintings on material from the gowns that he has to wear when he's in the hospital. So he uses... He uses hospital supplies. He uses paint. Uh, when he had his lung transplant done, he saved, he had his wife save all the gowns they had him in while he was recuperating, and then he repurposed them as canvas later on or substrate to paint on. So I just, you know, the way people approach this to tell their stories is amazing. And, you know, I always talk about that if, if writers write about their misery or the things not going well with them. Everyone goes, oh, they are so insightful. They are so, they're telling us their true selves. But when artists paint about 
their pain and illness, a lot of times it's just too strong for people. And it doesn't land up over their couch and it doesn't land up in a gallery. And well, it's, it's hard stuff to live with. It's yeah. hard to see every day. I can understand. But, but there's that dichotomy that writers get applauded for it and painters right. sort of get shunned for it. And I love the fact that I have a space where I can show some of this work because it's really amazing. A lot of it is really amazing. That is an amazing piece. If you hadn't explained it to me, you know, and that I talk to people about it all the time. Please explain yourself. What what inspired you to do this piece? Because I think there's so much more to it. Now, in in your investigation, are all these people um, artists prior to whatever they're going through? Not all of them. So some, some of them, them come to it afterward. Oh, this is interesting to me. And so, does their art take sometimes take on a more of an outsider artist? Yeah. Quality. Yeah, if they're not trained. Yeah. So th there's one piece when I give slideshows, I I always show by a woman who's actually a hairdresser, and she does. She's not really a painter. I don't know how many paintings she's ever done, but she did this amazing uh, painting of the doctor calling her up to tell her breast cancer had returned, and it's mm -hmm. it's this green figure and it's holding up a phone and a hand is coming out of the phone strangling her. And it's just such an amazing image, and I don't know if she's done other work or not. You know. Did she, you get to talk to her? I did, but it's a long time ago. Oh, but I, I don't so. think she's. I mean, I know she's not a painter. She's a hairdresser. So. I think. I think life-changing circumstances that move you to art are, are incredibly powerful. You know, they really, um, I mean, hopefully help you unleash the emotion that you're holding back. Yeah, yeah. And and I've gone the opposite way. Like, I did a lot of work about being sick when I was young. And then I just got, w once the medicine, I had my hips replaced, I had some new medicine, and I just couldn't do work about myself anymore. I was just... I was done well, telling do you, that story. Do you think your point of view changed also? I mean, not having having the medicine and not having to have the illness right here all the time. Yeah. One of the things I talk about when I do these lectures is how much energy it takes to be sick. And it's not unusual that everybody who is sick does work about them. Not everybody, but the people who are sick do work about themselves because it takes up so much space in your brain it makes sense that you would process it on a canvas. I'm I'm very much of the belief that you're painting yourself all the time, whether you know it or not. You know, wherever you are, it's hard to escape you on that canvas in some way, shape, or form, whether you like it or not. Maybe it's more. I'm looking obvious. at this painting over here. Somebody did of a cupcake, and I'm wondering what was what that says about them. I don't know. I don't know them, but I'm guessing there's something in there. Yeah. You know, for all I know, they're diabetic. <laughs> yeah, it could be. Right? <laughs> I mean, you just never know. And this is why I always tell people, tell your story. Yeah. You know, people don't know. Um, well, let's talk about your own personal work. Can okay. you talk about how it's changed? Oh, I do want to talk about, I saw, I didn't get to look at this the way I want, but I saw a whole thing about breast cancer. Yeah. So I, I had done... Um, this gets back to the Scarred for Life series. So I had been doing uh, the Scar series, and I, I did a show in Athens. I was in a show in Athens. I had a few pieces, probably seven or eight of them, in a show in Athens about six years ago. And I met a young woman there who is sort of a breast activist. In, she does a number of different things in Athens. And um, she called me up, and she's like, let's... She's also a photographer. So we decided to put a show together for Breast Cancer Awareness Week. This was before COVID, so four years ago. Here, and we, I just did prints of people with breast cancer. And it was really, and then she did, normally I do the photography, but this time she did the photography. Excuse me. And um, we got a, a number of people here. And it was a really interesting show because we we had one woman who did complete reconstruction. We had a guy who had breast cancer. We had a woman who 
had one breast, but no reconstruction. We had a mother daughter who both landed up getting breast cancer on the same breast okay. and we photographed them. Um, so I've done a couple sort of subsets of the Scarred for Life. I did a, a series of veterans that was shown at the National Museum of Health and Medicine for Veterans Day. And I think, you know, with COVID, I just can't even right, remember everything. the dates, probably six years ago. Mm -hmm. So generally, I'll do the scar print for anybody who wants a scar print done. And the reason is, it seems to give people sort of a closing to their healing. You know, if, if you got in a car accident or you had a lung transplant, you're going to remember the day you did that. That it's, it's sort of burned in your head. But there's no, because slowing, I'm saying this backward, because healing is such a slow process. You know, the, the muscles might heal, the bones will heal up, but your body's not 100% yet for some time. So a lot of times people don't really feel that they've had an official ending to the trauma of a car accident or something. Right, there's nothing announcing to you, that's it, you're done, you're healed. It's just one day you wake up and realize, oh, hey, nothing hurts. Today. Yeah, so the scars, for me doing a scar print from somebody, that for a lot of people that is the official ending of their healing. Or they mark it and they can put it on the wall and look at it and go, that's what I went through. That's it. It's not really part of me anymore. Mm -hmm. So I have people that, you know, have come to me before their operations to schedule, to do a print. Um, as soon as they, they're healed up enough to do it so ink doesn't get in the, the incision. And I've had people come to me years later. And it's been everything from heart transplants to uh, cutters to car you know whatever if there's a scar i probably printed it so the process on that people come to me we have a long conversation how did you get the scar what does it mean to you we usually sit and talk for about half hour 45 minutes they pick the color to do the print i have all these different background colors i print them i can do eight or ten prints and they, you know, they're sort of like fingerprints. They, there's not a lot of detail in them when you print them. And then I go back in and I paint into them. And if there's memorable things from their story of how they got the scar, I will add that into the print. So it has a real narrative based on their life experience. And um, I get the first one for my collection. They get the second one for their collection. Mm -hmm. That's really powerful, powerful stuff that people are coming to you at all stages of their scarred life. Yeah. And, and scars are interesting. Something. There's, I mean, there's a lot of people, you know, since I started mine, which is 20 years ago now, there's a number of people around the world doing them. And we tend to all know of each other. You know, there's a woman in France who does scars and she adds gold into them. Like this, you know, that whole Japanese yeah, yeah. thing of it. There's, there's a big group in Australia just doing straight photos. There's a lot of people doing just straight photos of scars, um, which are very powerful. It doesn't interest me because I don't really, to me, it's not about the, the mangling of the body and the damage done to the body. It's more about the survival of the person, the strength they had to get through it and what they did with their life afterward in the same way that I got on this medicine and then had a whole life afterward. Mm -hmm. So um, what I like about my series is you don't, I take pictures of the people with the ink on them so you can see where mm -hmm. on the body topographically the scar in their, or incision was, but I'm not, the ink sort of covers up the, the real damage to the body. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're not focused on, you know, how, how much, physical damage was done to the body. We're focusing on the survival story of it. The healing. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. So let's talk about your own work. You've got some very whimsical, lighthearted pieces. Yep. That I love. 
I, I, I was looking at your People with Animals on mm-hmm. Their Heads a series. <laughs> I love that very much. Thank you. Yeah. Can you tell me about your inspiration on this? I just, you know, at the same time as I did work when I was young about being sick, I always have done funny work. And I just, I like humor. I like telling jokes. I like making people laugh. That's sort of how I got through being sick. I was always funny in the hospital. Or at least I thought I was funny in the hospital. Um, (laughs) And I've always done, if I don't have anything real serious to say, I do these sort of lighthearted, whimsical figures. Um, And I always feel that, you know, I I always go back to the scar work. That's sort of deadly serious work. So in between that, I do these sort of more lighthearted things. For balance? Yeah. Yeah. You know what? I see a couple of questions here. So um, I saw something here. Oh wow! I wanted I want that day to come for me. I think she's talking about the healing. Um, can he show a scar print? Do you have anything? Yeah, I can go get one. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna stay here while he goes. First of all, I want to tell you about this space. <laughs> it's a it's is it a warehouse space? It's an old military bunker. It's an old military bunker space, and so it's got the curved ceilings, and you can kind of see it back there. And it's huge. And he also does like some video work on the side that he's repurposed it into his home. It's, it's beautiful and fascinating. And I love these sorts of raw spaces. They're incredible. So, and, and we're like, I don't know, a mile and a half away from downtown Los Angeles, just sort of on the outskirts. It's in, it's, it is Los Angeles, but it's just near the city of Alhambra, which is a very sleepy little city just outside sort of in the burbs but this space is gorgeous i'd like to show it to you but i don't want to intrude uh, okay here we go good it's coming with some work all right here we go Sky i work. should have planned this better i guess it's okay oh we've got multiples this is awesome okay so what first i do is i do you, print want, me the... to, do you want me to hold it up then no no i got, okay. it. got it so First thing I do is I, I print, put ink on the people, and then they write a narrative of why they have the scar, what the scar means to them. I, I always ask people, you know, tell me when you get out of the shower and you see your scar, what, is, what does it mean to you? So this is a woman who um, double mastectomy, landed up doing reconstruction, although I've heard since then she's had it removed. I don't. I haven't talked to her for a while. And then this is the print. So. Oh, so you actually print from their bodies. And I print directly off the bodies. <sighs> and then I go back in, and she has this thing for Hawaiian flowers. So I sort of work the flowers into the print. She had had some of them tattooed over her scars. So then I sort of redid them. So, and okay, here. so this is the scar running all the way to, across, correct? Yeah. And, yeah. and you do it in two colors? Is that usual? No, it's one color, and then I paint into it. Oh, okay. So it's one color, and you paint into it, but it's but the scar is making a line so that you've got this? Or? Yeah, well, the line is the scar. Right. And then I'm detailing the scar. But since you're scar. in one color, I mean, there's obviously, like, uh, a negative, yeah. so to speak. Yeah, yeah. And do you always do them the same color, or does that vary from person to person? Everybody does a different one. They pick the color oh, they that do. they want. And you I've give got... them a little freedom around that? Yeah. And this is the one of the guy who, the, the man who had the breast cancer. So his story, like I said, I always try to put in a little bit from the story. So he found out that he had breast cancer, and he didn't have good insurance. So he landed up getting a job at the post office so that he would have insurance. So I took, I did oh. his print, I shoved a stamp on, I went and had him stamp it with a, I'm with a bring date. I'm just a little bit closer so that you can see. I know you guys all like to see it up close and personal. So you can see that the scar was rolled in blue and then he went in with, is that a slightly darker blue around yeah. it to sort of highlight the scar itself? Yeah. And then added the personal touches. So, yeah, so I, I hear from people all the time that 
somebody called me just the other day about uh, doing a print that we're going to try to do next week. So. And they're obviously coming to you. You're not yeah. going to them, right? Mm -hmm. That's got to be something you put in place. You have yeah. to come to me if you want. Well, I've done some in other cities. When I go, if I speak at a college or something, we'll do workshops there. Um, there, there was one woman who was severely burned in New York, and Anna, my partner, and I, we went, we were in New York, and we did a print of her while we were there. Mm -hmm. So it's mostly just if if you have a space, I can do it. But usually people write me, and, and I'll get emails saying, like, we're going to be in L.A. in March. Are you going to be around? Can you do a print? Wow. So. And how many of you estimated that you've done the A hundred or so. And I'm just going to, as long as I can keep doing them, I'll keep doing them. Yeah. It, it, it must be such a personal experience for the people that are having it, too. I mean, to, because now you have to, like the woman that had breast cancer, you have to uncover, mm -hmm. you know, and then allow for paint to be rolled on you. Or, you have to let someone touch you. Right. You have to let someone touch you and, and see you. And then, and then you have to feel the pressure of... The actual paper or whatever. Do you put it on a piece of paper and then squish or? Yeah, you just put the paper on and then you <laughs> and then rub. Just, and then just rub to make sure that you get a good print. Yeah. I mean, that whole experience is a whole nother level of somebody seeing you. Well, it's also, as an artist, it's really, you know, you don't always get to have a teammate in your art. And this right. is really what this is. And you see the reaction. I mean, I've had people break down crying while they're doing it. I've had people break down crying looking at them because I'll show them and somebody will see like a form of cancer scar on the wall that maybe their daughter died from or something. I had one when the first time I showed this work, I was living at the brewery and I think I had three of them up. Yeah, hold on. The brewery is a space that's not far from here. It was a giant brewery, and it's been repurposed now into artist loft spaces. Um, mostly less expensive. I wouldn't say very inexpensive, but no. mostly less expensive. Well, they're big, so they're cheap per square foot, but they're still expensive. Yeah, but still expensive, and, and it has become like a big artist community here, mm -hmm. very close by. So they had an art walk, and this woman came in, and just I saw her looking at one piece, and she just broke down crying, and she's like, my... My daughter died from this, wow. you know. And you know, the thing is, if I'm doing a print of you, you survived. So I think of them all as sort of survival monuments. But other people can look at them, and everyone relates to them with their own histories. Do people write to you and thank you, and and maybe tell it, share with you stories or feelings that have come up since having the print done? Yeah, I, I got one of those about two weeks ago. And somebody was telling me that his, it sort of led to his divorce in a way because it was when he had had this illness, he had landed up in a wheelchair and um, I guess his wife didn't really want him to go and document this in in this way. And he said that started them talking and then, or uncomfortableness with the disability. And because um, he had written me and he wanted to, do you remember the day we did it? And do you have a, do you know the date we took the photo and this? And so we started having this long conversation about it. You know, was, was she, I don't know did, any I'm, of the background. I'm, I'm just thinking out loud. I mean, I could have done anything, but I'm just, I'm wondering, was she uncomfortable because it was, I don't know. Yeah. The possibilities there are very interesting. Yeah. But, you know, that happens a lot. It's, it is not unusual for people to break up when there's disability. Right. Shows up. Well, it's a hard thing. It's yeah. a hard thing to work around if, if it wasn't there before. And having a relationship isn't always easy anyway. Yeah. You know, and add another wrench into that. You yeah. Know, it, could, it could really mess everything up. Yeah. Or it could make everything more interesting. Depends, depends on the couple. Some <laughs> people want to be some it. people want to be caregivers, some don't. Yeah, this is true. So back to your own work. Okay. What what is your inspiration lately? Well, I've been doing lots of 
desert scenes. You know, there's a, the Shigali ones. The Shigali ones. Um, I think I posted one of them. It was, I think it was a, I don't remember if it was, I can't remember now because I looked at it very briefly. Somebody on a horse, but not really on a horse, but sort of floating into like a little canyon. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, you know, being out in the desert. So this house is in Los Angeles, but we also have a place out by Joshua Tree. And during COVID, that's pretty much where I was the, the full time. In Joshua Tree? Yeah. And uh, there was nobody around. And our our house there is in the middle of nothing. We're not near other houses at all. So it just sort of these epic expanses and people sort of floating around just sort of popped up through my head. But now you've been here. Well, I go back and forth. Right, but you're mostly in Los Angeles, right? Yeah, I would say about 60% of the time. Did your work change from, I mean, we're not really post-COVID quite yet. No. Um, but maybe more post-COVID than we were. Has your work shifted at all? Well, what I'm trying to do is get back into doing oils here. Mm -hmm. Because in the desert, there's so much dust. You have to do acrylic, mm -hmm. at least in our studio. I paint in an old barn out there. Mm -hmm. And if there's a dust storm, if I did oil painting, the dust the would all stick. So I'm trying to get back into doing oils here and doing acrylics there. But as far as imagery, I haven't, I haven't been here long enough periods to really start a whole new series yet. So do you paint often? Not not enough. Not as much as you'd like. Yeah. Is the the standard answer yeah. that I always hear. <laughs> not, not as much as, much as I, I want. I just I'm also doing other. I'm working on a, a book of stories of being sick when I was a kid, and so that's taken up a lot of time. So I keep, you know, it's as long as I'm doing something creative, I don't really care. Yeah. In the the stories, your book stories, are you going to have artwork that accompanies it? Just a little, at the beginning of each chapter, there's going to be a little black and white drawing, but they're, they're not really about art. And they're not really stories about me being sick. They're stories about things that happened around me because I was sick. Things that, that I observe, I think observed differently because I was sick. Do you want to give us an example? Not yet. <laughs> I, thought, I was hoping I was going to tease a little something out of your book from you. No, they're just they're things where I observations that I see one way, like things being in a hospital that maybe I would see differently having been there a lot. Right, than somebody uh, else would see. Yeah. I, I okay. All right. Well, I, I look forward to the book. Thanks. I would Me, like to read it. I would like to get it done. So hopefully, it's I have two different people helping me edit it now. So. One is, is writing as a, I, I mean I, I always can I always tell people you know when I see that they're writers I was like because I, I'm so not a writer I don't have the patience for writing any words down or expressing well, myself. I'm not no I'm not because I miss so much school my grammar is terrible so I I always have to have people help me but I can get the gist down I can get the whole story down but I'm not good at most of the stuff I write is two to 3,000 words, short stories. I can't write. Years ago, I used to date someone who, who would be writing novels. And they would come to her completely full formed. And she said she would just sit there and type. And the whole the conversations, I cannot do that. I, so these are I'm just little first person way. stories and my weird little takes on things. Yeah. I've I am definitely not built in that way at all. No. No, I was amazed. I, I was really in awe that she could do that. But the fact that you can even sit down for two or 3,000 words and get something out, that's... Oh. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see if anybody likes them once they're done. I bet they will. Yeah, I hope. I mean, you've had a very interesting life thus far. It's been interesting. So um, what, do you have like extensive plans for art and med? I'm just trying to expand it. Um, you know, things were really sort of going like this until COVID. I was speaking all over the place. I was constantly on airplanes. And then that sort of slowed down. It's just starting to pick up again. I just 
gave the keynote at the uh, American Art Therapy Association uh, convention, which was interesting because I'm not an art therapist, but they decided my work was worthy to talk to them. I'm going to be helping the University of Indiana add sort of a humanities component to their curriculum. So between that and expanding what I'm doing at USC, and I never know where it's going to go from there. You know, this it could, is all very exciting. It could just all pick up again, or it could not. I have no idea post-COVID how the world's going to be. You know what I love about this story is I love how, I mean, th is this something you could even have foreseen, foreseen happening? I mean, it's all sort of unveiling. Well, what was so interesting is that, so I was, I'm, I was doing the graphics, and I was really just, I just hit the point where I hated it. And um, I was on the phone with Anna one night and just saying, I, I just don't want to do this anymore. It's, I can't remember what had happened, but some it was one of those midnight calls where somebody is frantic and I was just like, I can't stand this anymore. And people kept coming up to me and saying, well, you've had such an interesting life. You've had this bifurcated life of being sick and then being healthy and artwork about illness and you know all these interesting people. And uh, she said, well, what do you want to do? And I said, well, everybody tells me I should be out giving talks and I should be speaking. And that, you know, in theory, that sounded great, although I didn't know what it would entail. And she said, well, what would your goal be? And I said, to be able to make a living off of it somehow and to do a TED talk about mm -hmm. And she said, well, how many years down the road? And I said, five years. And it took six. So I got to do a TED Talk in six years. So it's sort of, you know, I always joke about the fact that I never made a plan for myself until I was 52. And then things started working out. And I attribute it all to having a whiteboard and writing out what I wanted to happen. But until then, whether it was the greeting card company, it just sort of fell in my lap. I was doing little drawings and people said, oh, put that on a shirt, I'll buy it. And then a rep saw them and called me and said, oh, we'll represent you. Or doing the, like, nothing was planned out until I was 56 and then I, or 52. And then I finally was like, okay, I'm going to make a plan here. And your plan is serving you. I mean, it sounds like you were, there was a plan. You just didn't know it. No, there was no plan. I was just doing graphics if I got jobs. But I'm talking about there was a plan. Oh, no. <laughs> there was a plan. That I don't we'll be believe here. in. I don't oh, you believe don't believe in, in that? No. No? You're no. not, um, there's no essence of spirituality on this one? Nope, zero. That's okay. If so. Everybody does their own thing. Yeah, I've seen enough really sick people to not believe that there's that. I can understand that. So. I can understand that. In fact, that's why I believe that is one of the stories in the book. Oh, really? Yeah. See, now I really Why my atheism. I really want to know this part now. Okay. Uh, well, you're going to have to tell me when the book is done, for okay. sure. I will do that. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, let me see. Does it, and oh, I saw somebody, <laughs> I have to tell you, somebody jumped on. Her name is Giselle. Hi, Giselle. And Giselle said, I'm going to watch this just because I pulled, you know, I, I stole a picture from your, one of your, I don't know, I think it was your webpage. And you're standing with a piece of your art and you're wearing green cowboy boots. Oh, yeah, I have a lot of cowboy boots. And she said, anybody that's wearing green cowboy boots, I got to listen to them. I got to know what's happening with them. And so she, I saw that she jumped on. There she is. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Well, here, if, be, before we go, I can show you my closet. There's a lot of cowboy boots. Really? Yeah. For me or for everybody? Everybody. Everybody can come and see this? Yeah. Okay. So I'm very proud of my I have a great selection of cowboy boots. I was just bragging about your space while you walked away, and I was like, I don't know if I can show you this space. So the space used to be military bunker, and we have three of them, and the other two are empty, and we rent those out for music video shoots, things like that. And then this one was built out as a live space. Oh, I didn't realize there were three. And sense. it was the clubhouse for the Mongols in the 70s. Oh, really? So who knows what happened here at that point. Oof. And then before uh, we bought it, 
it was a crime scene cleanup business. So if uh, somebody got killed, they would go out and clean it up. So nobody, none of that stuff was here. It was Thankfully. just the equipment to do it. Thankfully, none of that stuff was here. Yeah. All right. Well, let's take take us to your closet. Okay. Let me. I'm gonna undo you guys here, and we're just gonna walk to the closet so that we. And can this see is just for her. Cowboy boots. Yeah. There's. Oh. Oh my gosh. All right. <laughs> All right, you guys. Here. I'm just gonna sort of. And then tilting down. There's some dumb old tennis shoes, but. <laughs> well, you know, sometimes you need tennis shoes. Cowboy boots galore. You're a man of after my own heart. I have many, many, many cowboy boots. Oh my gosh. So many. I started wearing these because I couldn't, uh, after I had a bad hip replacement and I couldn't bend down to tie shoes. So I started wearing cowboy boots. There you go. It makes sense. I love them. Which ones are the green ones that you were wearing? I don't see the, them. Uh, I think the green ones are out in the desert. There's oh, more in the desert there's too. There's more in the desert. Okay. Yeah. All right, people. I'm going to, I'm going to, let's sign off here. Okay. Goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> Need purple boots, what Giselle says. I'll take them. But when <laughs> take I see them, them, you buy them when I see them, I'll buy them. <laughs> all right, you guys. Thank you for being here with us. I will see you all later. Bye.